The exponential map goes from the set little GLNR, which is the set of all n by n matrices, to the set big GLNR, which is the set of invertible matrices. And this map is not invertible, but we've seen that there is a local inverse for it, in the sense that there's a neighborhood U inside little GLN that contains the zero matrix and a neighborhood V inside big GLN that contains the identity matrix such that when you restrict the exponential map to U it lands in V and it gives you a bijection. In other words there's an inverse map um, called the logarithm. So really it is invertible and both maps are smooth and very very nice. It's actually called a diffeomorphism, a local diffeomorphism. So we can think of this as providing us with coordinates locally near the identity in big GLN in the following way. So exp of a11 up to a1n down to an1 across to ann where a11 up to ann are in a neighborhood of zero. They're all close to zero. This gives us a parameterization of parameterization of V, this neighborhood of the identity in GLNR. In other words, anything near the identity can be written in this form for a unique A11 up to ANN. So these AIJs are local coordinates. on V. Right, so they're certainly the local coordinates on U and now we're using the exponential map to turn them into local coordinates on V. And what we'd like is for the same thing to work for any matrix Lie group. In other words, if I replace big GLNR with a closed matrix subgroup G and I replace little GLNR with its Lie algebra little g, then we want the restriction of the exponential map to have this same property that the Lie algebra gives us local coordinates on the Lie group. So let's try and justify that this is true. It is true. It'll take a bit of work, but it is true. So let's let's try this. Let G inside GLNR be a matrix group, which remember means a topologically closed subgroup of GLNR and let little g be its Lie algebra. Um, so take u prime to be just g, little g, intersected with u. Right, u, remember, lives inside little g LNR. It's a neighborhood of the identity. So just intersect that with little g to get a neighborhood of the identity inside little g. This is a neighborhood sorry, a neighborhood of zero in little g. And let's v, let v prime be the intersection of big G with V, which is a neighborhood of the identity in invertible matrices. So this is a neighborhood of the identity now in G. And let's look at the exponential map from here to here. So first of all I claim the exponential map does actually go from little g to big G just by definition of little g. Little g with a set of things such that t of a uh, set of things v such that x tv is in g for all g. So in particular the exponential of anything in the Lie algebra lands in the Lie group. Okay. And we already know the exponential of anything in U lands in V, so in particular the exponential of anything in little g intersect U lands in big G intersect V. So aren't we done? Isn't this telling us exactly that this neighborhood of zero gives us, via the exponential map, local coordinates on G? Well, let's think. Is this an invertible map? Well, we know that the map from u to v is invertible. In particular, we know the map from u to v is injective. And this is a restriction of that map 
so it's certainly injective. But is it surjective? And this is slightly less clear. Well, you might be forgiven for thinking what could possibly go wrong. The map from U to V is surjective. I'm cutting down by you know intersecting with little g and, and big G, but how how's that going to stop it from being surjective? Well, here's a picture of what you might imagine going wrong. So this is supposed to be a picture of um, G L N R drawn in the local coordinates that we constructed above. In other words, the points here are like, so this this would be the identity matrix x of zero. This would be x of some other matrix. So the coordinates are like the matrix entries of the logarithm. And here is a group. All right, so this is supposed to be our, our subgroup G. All right, this is a complete completely fictitious picture that doesn't really represent any particular group I'm just saying you know G is some subset that passes through the origin okay but let's imagine that rather than just looking like this which is kind of nice G actually does something more like this so it comes back on itself and gets very very close to the origin in fact gets arbitrarily close to the origin but never quite gets there. So the, remember, this origin here is the identity matrix. And now you can imagine that when you intersect with a very small ball, you know, exp of little g might end up being, oops, it's going to be a bit hard to draw, might end up just being this bit of big G and you might miss this bit completely because in order to get over here you have to exponentiate something actually very large and we've restricted to a very small ball so that's what you can imagine I'm worried about um, in the end this won't happen what we're going to prove is this can't happen um, so in some sense this is a very cartoonish picture of something that doesn't happen so if you're struggling to really understand what's going on in the picture it's no surprise. So let me be more precise. If it fails to be surjective, if this exponential map fails to be surjective, then uh, if, so, if surjectivity fails, then, you know, there's an element G in V prime, so in, in the Lie group and uh, inside this neighborhood of the identity such that G is not of the form um, exp of uh, something in U prime. And actually, because we, we're only looking for local coordinates, we're allowed to shrink U and V. Right, so we can make things more and more local, zoom in near the origin to get local coordinates. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is, let's suppose that that fails, this surjectivity fails, f no matter how small we shrink this guy. So in actual fact, what I'm worried about is that there's a sequence gi in, in v prime such that gi converges to the identity and such that it's not in the exponential of, of u prime. So something like this sequence of matrices here that are coming in from far away and getting very close to the identity. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this happens, that there really is such a sequence, and we'll get a contradiction. So we're going to aim for a contradiction. So, here we go. First thing I'm going to do is 
I am going to pick um, a vector space orthogonal complement for the Lie algebra. So remember the Lie algebra little g inside little gln r is a vector space, a subspace of little gln. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a complement, in other words a, a subspace of gln r which um, it's not, it doesn't have to be at right angles but you could imagine it's something like at right angles to little g. So um, the only intersect at the origin and the span of the two subspaces is everything. So let's pick a complement which I'm going to call W for little g, i.e. little g intersect W is just 0, and um, g plus W is everything. So any matrix can be written as something in the Lie algebra plus something in W. And you can always pick a complement for a, a subspace, because we are working in a nice uh, setting of, of vector spaces over R or C. All, right, all, all this works over C as well, but you know, I'm just writing R because it's uh, easier to pick one. Okay, so in my picture, um, here's my group again. Here's the identity. Remember the Lie algebra is the tangent space to the group at the identity. So in other words, it's in this picture, it's the x-axis. It's a subspace. So this blue thing I've just drawn is, is little g in the cartoon, and w is going to be a complement. So some, oops, something like this uh, vertical line here, the y-axis. So let's just draw it as, as that, as w. So the first claim is um, that the map that takes V in little g and W in W to x V times x W is um, a local diffeomorphism just like x. What does that actually mean? What it means is um, it's a smooth map with smooth inverse locally. So that, you know there's a there's a neighborhood which I I don't want to call U. I, I'm running out of letters. Neighborhood A of zero in uh, little g plus w and a neighborhood B of the identity in. Uh, G L N R such that this map, which maybe I'll give it a name F, defines as a map from A to B, which is uh, a bijection, which is smooth and has smooth inverse. But let's just focus on the bijection part. Um, okay, why is this claim true? Well, it's actually exactly the same proof that the exponential map um, is a local diffeomorphism. So the, the proof there was, well, we compute the derivative of the exponential map at the origin, at the zero matrix, and it's you know, the derivative is the identity, um, and therefore the map is invertible by the inverse function theorem. So this, this claim, I'm not going to prove it here. I'll leave it as an exercise. This follows. from the inverse function theorem. What you have to do is you have to compute the derivative of this map f in the same way we computed the derivative of just the exponential map. So what is that telling us? It's telling us that sufficiently close to the identity anything can be written in this form. So if gi is near the identity, which if you remember our little sequence gi was converging to the identity, so sufficiently far along this sequence we're very close to the identity, 
then gi is of the form exp vi exp wi for vi in little g and wi in its complement w. Okay. Now, with this particular sequence, so this is, I guess, step two, this particular sequence gi um, is not in exp of u prime. And remember, u prime is just the set where u intersects a little g. So in other words, um, is not going to be of the form x of vi. Um, so where this vi is in little g. So in this representation of gi as x of vi x of wi, wi is not zero for all i. In particular, we can divide wi by its matrix norm, because its matrix norm is not going to be zero. So if we do that, what we get is uh, this, this guy, wi over its matrix norm, is then a matrix whose matrix norm is 1, because if you take the matrix norm of, of this expression, you're just going to get norm wi over norm wi, which is 1. It's a matrix with norm 1, and it lives in W, the orthogonal complement, or the complement to uh, little g. In particular, this, well, it's a sequence of matrices, right? It depends on I, converges to something. It converges to a matrix with norm 1 in W, because the set of matrices with norm 1 is a nice compact set of matrices. It's like a sphere of matrices. Um, so it converges. Another way of saying it is it's a bounded, closed and bounded set of matrices, so it's going to converge um, to something, some matrix, little w in w. And little w is not zero because the matrix norm is one, right? Because it's the limit of things with matrix norm one. Okay, so the way we're going to get our contradiction is to prove that little w is actually in little g. And that will be a contradiction because w is in the complement to g. So, so we need to show little w is in g, as this will give a contradiction. Okay, and what do we need to prove uh, to show that it's in little g? We need to show that exp tw is in capital G for all t. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix t. We're going to prove that exp wt, uh, tw is in g, and then let t vary, and our, you know our proof will then show it for all t. So let's fix a value of t, and this, this argument will work for all t. So the trick is to consider t over norm wi. So this is a number, a real number. Right, t, is, t is a real number, remember. So it can be written as an integer plus something. So ni is an integer, it's going to be a positive integer, or non-negative integer, and epsilon i is the sort of, um, the part between 0 and 1. Right, so it's an integer plus a little bit. What do we know about uh, these numbers? Well, ni is going to go to infinity as i goes to uh, to infinity 
Why is that? Well, because t is fixed here. Remember, I fixed a particular value of t. Wi gets very small because... Um, going up. Where is it? Ah, yes. Little gi is tending to the identity. So in this uh, expression for little gi, vi and wi have to tend to the identity as well. Sorry, have to tend to zero. So the x vi, x wi is tending to the identity. So this is because wi is going to zero. So norm wi is going to zero. And that means that t over norm wi is getting very, very big. So its integer part is getting very, very big. OK, so ni goes to infinity as i goes to infinity. OK, so this is, I guess, this is step three. Uh, so um, let, let me just call this step four now. So what, what I want to do is to prove something's in G. Right? I want to prove that exp TW is in G. So first of all, exp WI is in G for all I. This is because if we go back and look, GI is exp VI, exp WI, exp VI is exp of something in the Lie algebra, so exp VI is in G. So exp WI equals exp minus VI GI. Both of these are in G, so this is in G. Okay, uh, what next? Well, because G is a group, I can uh, multiply this guy with itself as many times as I like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply it with itself n i times x w i to the n i. Right. So because w i um, commutes with itself as a matrix, we have the law of uh, exponentials that allows us to take this n i inside x, but we get x n i w i. So this is in G for all I. And now because X is a continuous map and because G is a closed group, this uh, sequence of things, if it converges to anything, it converges to something in G. So we need to prove that it converges to something. That's that's going to be the point. Well, what, what is it? Uh, exp of ni wi is exp of what's ni? ni is t over wi minus epsilon i. So this is t over wi matrix number wi minus epsilon i times wi. So in other words, that's exp of t wi over norm wi minus epsilon i wi. And I claim this converges. Why does this converge? Well, epsilon i wi converges to zero. It converges to zero because epsilon i is just some, some parameter between zero and one, and wi is converging to zero because x of wi is supposed to be converging to the identity. And the other term, wi over norm wi is converging to w by assumption. So this whole thing is converging to exp tw. And I, as I was saying, because g is a closed group, this is in g, right? Because it's a topologically closed group, the limit of a sequence in g stays in g. And that's what we wanted to prove. So going back up, I was trying to prove that x t w is in G. I'm trying to prove that for all t, I've proved it for any t that I want. Okay, and this gives us a contradiction because um, why does it give us a contradiction? Because little w is in the complement to the Lie algebra, and what I've just proved is actually little w is in the Lie algebra, and you, a vector space can't be both in uh, sorry a, a vector can't be both in a subspace and its complement. A non zero vector like w. Okay, so the outcome of this long and complicated argument is that 
we have local coordinates on any matrix Lie group. So consequence, and this is the important bit, um, for any matrix group G, the Lie algebra little g, um, exp from little g to big G admits a local inverse. In other words, we can use um, local coordinates on little g near zero, zero matrix, to get local coordinates on big G near the identity. So this will be extremely useful um, because it's always useful to have local coordinates. So for obvious reasons I'm going to call this an exponential chart. So call these local coordinates an exponential chart because it's coming from the exponential map. 